remember the aching pain of not being picked? I'm thinking of when you're small, not being chosen. You're a snotty nose, not you, <laughs> hypothetically. I'm a snotty nosed, knobble kneesed kid. And the PE teacher, who's a great hulking brute, PE, that's phys ed. Do we call it anything else? The gym teacher. He comes out and he goes, Right, boys, get it up, get against the wall. Right, you two, your team captains. Doesn't matter what the sport is, could be basketball, could be soccer or football, could be rugby, could be cricket. You two, captains, choose. And they both have a little think. And you know who they're going to pick first. And they pick them. And you get this sinking feeling in your gut that you're not even going to be in the middle. Do you know that as they pick him, I'll have him, you have him, you pick him, I'll have him, that you know that they're not thinking, ah, oh, you'll be the fourth best in my team. They're thinking, how can I avoid picking that one? <laughs> and you're there like this at the end. And, and it's even worse when there's an odd number. So, ah, oh, we don't really need, need you. You can stay against the wall. Did you ever have that feeling? Is it just me? I think lots of people have. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you're the jock. Do we have any jocks? And you were, you were always picked first. We want him. We want him on our team. Or, or maybe you were always the captain at every sport, and you're always good at that, always. So maybe for some of us, we might uh, remember that feeling of not making the great. Do you know there's a, a course you wish you could go on? There's a school you wish you could get into, a university perhaps. And you do the exam, and you work, and you do hard work, and you open the envelope, and the grades are not what you need. Maybe some of us know that feeling of not getting that. Maybe more seriously, maybe you've just wanted somebody to love you. Do you know there's somebody, and you wish they would love you or treat you with love? Maybe a parent. Maybe someone you wish would want to marry you, and they don't return your love. You know, that feeling. I think for all of us, we've all at some point known something what it's like to be rejected, to be not chosen. Well, I have news for you. I have something good to tell you. You have been chosen by God. You have been chosen by God. How does that make you feel? God chose you. In the divine soccer game where you're all lined up against the wall, God chose you. When it came to getting into university, God wants you in his university. When it comes to being loved, God wants to love you. He wants you to love him. You have been personally chosen by God. And this is not just one of those kind of um, natural, normal things. Oh, everybody's got in. Do you know, like a fake prize? This is not a participation award. It's not everybody's chosen. As long as you're human, you're in. Just forget about it. God has to adopt you. God wants to adopt you. He has chosen you so that he can adopt you into his family, as a member of his family. God chooses to adopt you, not to foster you. Fostering is a wonderful thing to do. But when you foster, it's temporary. It's showing love for a while. When you adopt, you bring them into your family. You give them your name. You make them an inheritor of your property. That is your identity in Christ. You are chosen by God. He is willing to adopt you like a beautiful baby. I just said that to have an excuse to show you these pictures I found online. Oh. I was thinking, what's a good image for being chosen and adopted? Would you adopt that one? Isn't that sweet? I thought that was too sweet to put words across, though. What about this one? tiny little thing. And then this one, I chose because it's a bit weird to have a floating arm. Do you know? His parent is a hand. It's disturbing. 
That's just because I thought, that's cute. There you are. So, you are chosen by God, and Paul tells us all about it in his letter to the Ephesians. In the first chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Praise God. Why? Why should we praise God? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He chose us. Praise God. Why? Because he chose us. What has he chosen us for? He has chosen us to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, this next sentence is a cracker. This is the most amazing sentence. Look at verse 5. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. That's just the first third. Hear those words. And practically every word of this sentence needs some thought. Just in the first third of that sentence, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. So, word one, predestined. God chose us. God planned for us, before us, from the beginning, before creation, he planned for you. What about free will? We'll come to free will later. Next word, adoption. Adopted. This is like a a technical term. It means you are taken from one situation and given rights you didn't previously have. This adoption relationship, you're pretty much no one to the person who adopts you before they adopt you. You might be friends or something like that. They they might like you in some way. But they take you where you have no legal rights to them, and they give you those legal rights. Sons. Sonship. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. That's one of those interesting words. Do you know... um, when they revise the Bible, they look at how language has changed often, and then they make the revision because language has changed. We don't use words the way that they once were, perhaps 400 years ago. So, for example, 50 years ago, I could say mankind, and everybody would just know I meant humanity, wouldn't they? You could say mankind, and they'd be like, we know you're referring to everyone. We don't, we don't have any hint of sexism in using that word mankind. But now if I said mankind, you would be quite right to say, I'm just checking. Are you including the girls? Is this womankind as well, or do you literally just mean the males of the world? So when we look at that word mankind, we change it to humanity, because it just makes sense. It's just clear. This word sonship, we could easily just uh, translate as child of God because we are all children of God, and because this is open to both men and women. But the reason in lots of versions of the Bible they keep the word sonship is because at the time, it meant something bigger. It meant that you would inherit. And each of us, men and women, are given this right to sonship when God adopts us. We don't become boys if we're girls before, no. But we do get the rights of the sons of God. We become his adopted sons. So, how has this happened? How have we been predestined for adoption to sonship? We have, this has happened through Jesus Christ. It's happened in accordance with God's pleasure and will, in accordance with God's pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. So, number one, the method is Christ. 
Christ is the one who does this. It's done through Christ. Number two, the plan is God's. God has planned this. Number three, the reason is grace. God's grace. God's loving, giving grace. God is gracious, and He gives freely of Himself. And we praise Him for this. His grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves, Jesus. The next verse. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us, With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. God gives us this. Jesus gives us the ability to be forgiven our sins so that we can be redeemed to God. We have all sinned. We all let God down. We all live lives which are not the way God intended. We all sin, and Jesus forgives us through his blood so that we can be redeemed to our Father God, redeemed to his love, redeemed to eternal life. And he gives us knowledge of the mystery of his will. It's still a mystery. But Jesus gives us knowledge of this mystery. God, that's deep, isn't it? Do you find that heavy? A bit profound. So I figured, because that's rather profound, we'll do something you won't like. We should talk about it. What I think we should do is uh, turn to your neighbor, and if you really don't like this sort of thing, just say, hmm, weather's nice. Or turn to somebody. Please leave nobody out, because that's... That means you're not chosen. Make sure that everyone's got someone to speak to. I've told you what that feels like. And just uh, perhaps look at the meaning of this uh, from verse 3 until verse 10, or perhaps raise the things that you think you don't get. Do you know? Please, have a chat. Did that go all right? What do you think? Raise things? Get your thinking? Because the next bit is tricky too. So we're going to look at the next bit, and I'm just going to read it to you. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So Paul mentions predestination twice, just in this chapter, and it's a big deal. People have argued about it since forever. I was just telling Maureen and Rick that um, I found the sermon notes that I'd made years ago when I was quite young on this passage, and I solved the problem of predestination. (laughs) And uh, I was looking at this passage just going, Ben, that poor church. (laughs) What are you doing? <laughs> it's, it's always been this big deal with people trying to understand how we both have free will and how God has predestined from the beginning. And, but it is an important issue. You see, you can take it into this realm of the academic where everyone just has lots of fun arguing about how things could possibly work. But it is really important. Every time something goes wrong, it becomes a live issue. Every time there's a tragedy, every time there's a disaster like an earthquake or a tornado or a tsunami, every time people seem to be seemingly meaninglessly killed, every time something horrible happens just to you personally, something in your personal life, in your family life, we say, why God? 
Why me, God? Why have you done that, God? God, if you love me, how has that happened? God, if you are all-powerful and you love, how is this possible that this happened? Did you make this happen, God? We say that every time. It is an important issue, and there are these bizarre two extremes in the way people treat predestination. There's one set of people who are sure that God is controlling every tiny aspect of everything that ever happens. So every single snowflake that falls has been planned. Every single event that happens is planned. And even that can get to the absurd where God even planned for us to do the sin we just did. I find that a bit difficult. And then there's another, the other extreme, which is God is like um, a guy who set things going and then wandered off. God is like a clockmaker. Do you know? He wound up the clock and then he walked away and the clock keeps ticking and God doesn't do anything or get involved. I don't think either of those are the way, but those are two extremes in predestination. Look at what Paul says. He says, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. Then in verse 5, he says, He predestined us for adoption. And then in verse 11, he says, God works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. That's leaning one way, but Paul also says, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. He says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. I see in that two indications of free will two places where Paul knows that we have to make a choice, where we've made a decision. We were the first to put our hope in Christ. We have to hope. We have to hear. We have to believe. We have to move in this. Now, as I said, this might be too complicated for me to to solve, so I've got a quote here from Francis Folkes. Poor old Francis Folkes doesn't get quoted enough in church, so we're redressing that balance. This doctrine of election or predestination is not raised as a subject of controversy or speculation. It is not set in opposition to the self-evident fact of human free will. It involves a paradox that the New Testament does not seek to resolve and that our finite minds cannot fathom. Paul emphasizes both the sovereign purpose of God and our free will. He took the gospel of grace and offered it to all. Isn't that great? Solve the whole thing. Well done, Francis. God bless you. He's pointing out, firstly, this wasn't controversial when Paul wrote it. He knew that people could understand that we had this balance of free will and God's plan. He points out that it does involve a paradox which is beyond us. It is something that we will not understand until God shows us. It is more than our finite minds can fathom. But we can hold this intention and see that God has a sovereign purpose and that we have free will and that God offers us his grace. I believe that God chose us in him before the creation of the world. I believe that God predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And I believe that God gives us the freedom to choose him. He wants to adopt us. He wants to adopt each of us. He wants to adopt you. Are we going to hear? Are we going to hear that message? Are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the gospel? Are you going to put your hope in him? God has a plan for the fullness of of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth, will be united in God. And there are horrible things that happen in this fallen world. There are bad things that happen to each of us. God is actively working to unite all things in him. God is inviting us, calling us, to be his adopted children, to hear, to believe, to receive. 
He has offered you an inheritance. He has chosen you to be his child. We should praise him for that. Praise the Lord. Can we pray together? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for choosing me. Thank you, Father, for choosing each of us. We hear your gospel. We accept your sacrifice. We receive your grace. May your Holy Spirit bind us in this inheritance. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen.